All right. <clears throat> well, we finished, if you remember the prophet Isaiah last week, I don't even know how long we were in it. How long were we in Isaiah? 66 chapters. <laughs> <laughs> Was it a year? Was it a year? No. Okay. Last year? Am I scaring you? Okay. Sorry, but You know, if you spit on him when you talk, he gets baptized. It's okay. I'll stand like that. <laughs> you can run, but you can't hide. Thank God for that. Mm-hmm. So where do we go after Isaiah? We have to go back to Kings. Yeah, Second Kings, sir. Yes and no. Oh. We go back to Second Kings to only to find out what prophet we need to look at next. As I said quite some time ago, when we entered uh, this one era, when Israel, the <clears throat> Northern Kingdom, was about to be conquered. And taken captive by the Assyrians. And as Judah was following suit with his behavior, and it was also a guaranteed uh, discipline from God, and they'll eventually get conquered by the Babylonians, they'll be taken away, um, that God flooded the scene with prophets. He spoke. And he spoke, and he spoke, and he spoke again. He said the same thing many, many times. We saw it in Isaiah, how often God gives Isaiah the same message. And if there's just little, little differences, uh, slight variations in the message. But it's simply, I've warned you, you still got a little time. Are you going to change? If you don't, here comes the judgment. When the judgment comes, after you serve your time, uh, you know, after I swat you, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to restore you, some of you small portion of you, and you get to rebuild. That's pretty much the story. And God says that repeatedly, doesn't he? All right. Now, at the same time, God does more than one thing at the same, you know, once. He's, he's also working with other countries like the Assyrians, the ones that he actually used to discipline his people and to take that northern kingdom, Israel, away. So, we actually now look at a prophet that shows up and speaks during this time, though what he says doesn't happen yet, just like Isaiah. But we got to place this certain prophet, who, by the way, is Nahum, Nahum. He shows up right around here. And we're going to do my best to kind of show you the placement in biblical history of Nahum. And his job and the message he has and uh, we'll see how far we get tonight but we'll start with an introduction to it <clears throat> uh, to, to place Nahum in a accurate biblical history as best as possible got to remind you a few things about Isaiah that we finished last week. I want you to remind you that uh, he was called the Prince of Prophets. He stood before four kings. Uh, he, uh, he was primarily sent to speak to the southern kingdom of Judah. Remember, that's comprised of Judah and Benjamin, those two tribes. And it's in the sixth chapter of the verse one uh, of Isaiah's scroll, where Isaiah says that it's in the year that King Uzziah died that he sees God, he has his vision. He sees God high and lifted up. Right in this temple, that whole thing, you know, that sort of amazing uh, experience he has in the presence of God. And where, where God then speaks and says, I got this message I got to give of uh, impending judgment. I wonder who we should send. And uh, there appears to be silence in heaven until Isaiah, who's kind of hiding behind the curtain, speaks up. I'll go. Remember that? And then God gives him the message. And then the rest of the prophet Isaiah, as we are looking through it, was the message. Okay, an extended. In 739 BC, do your best to imagine a, uh, a timeline I'm going to give you. Wish I had a whiteboard here, I'd, I'd write it out. 739 BC is when Uzziah dies. Isaiah's prophecies concerning 
Judah um, are at least 100 years before the southern kingdom of Judah eventually falls to Babylon in 586 BC. And it's at the time that he's writing that the northern kingdom of Israel is in the final stretch and it falls to the Assyrians in 722 BC. And that's told in 2 Kings 17. So I'm going to ask you first, open to 2 Kings chapter 17, because that is where we left off before hitting the prophet Isaiah. I just want to remind you some things that we've seen here. I mean, Chapter 17, verse 5, this is where Israel is carried captive to Assyria. Do you see it? The king of Assyria invaded the land, came to Samaria, that was the capital of the northern kingdom of Israel. For three years he besieged it. In the ninth year of Hosea, king of Assyria, he captured Samaria. He carried the Israelites, uh, 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 Israelites away to Assyria. He placed them in Halah, etc., etc., uh, verse uh, 24 of chapter 17, the king of Assyria brought what? People from? Babylon. 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 What else? Kutha. Kutha. Ava. Ava. And what does he do with them? Placed them in the city of Samaria. Ah, uh huh. Okay. And remember, that was part of what ancient warfare was like. When an empire would come in and conquer you, they would take a lot of you, most of your people out. And then literally spread them all over in their own empire. They would take people from these various territories that they have conquered. And they would bring them and make them live where you were. To water down your race, your religion, the whole thing, your culture. So that everybody in the empire loses who they were, national memory, all that stuff. And then they could be recreated, rebuilt into one new nation, one new empire, all out of fear and uh, subjugation, having to believe in whatever gods the reigning empire wanted everybody to believe in and subject themselves to that governing authority. So a melting pot. <clears throat> yeah, kind of like when your borders are open. Right. And all these people can come in. And you have people that do all this stuff to water down your, your culture and your, your faith and, and teach you other stuff. You know how it goes. We don't even have to go there. All right. So, um, 2 Kings 18. Just look at it. If you remember, this is where Hezekiah, he becomes the king in Judah. And the king of Assyria, uh, Shedecherib. Looks like Sennacherib of Assyria. He invades Judah because not only did he come in and do what I just said to the northern kingdom of Israel, he picks on the southern kingdom of Judah because it is the world empire at the time. It is the powerhouse. And it, it could do whatever it wants. So it's picking on Judah. And it's picking on the current king of Judah, Hezekiah. Makes threats. We're going to come get you. We're going to do to you what we did to your, uh, your family members up north. That's where he calls for Isaiah. He has a conversation with Isaiah in chapter 19, verse 2. That's where, that's where we were introduced to Isaiah, which is why we camped out in the prophet Isaiah. You got it? Okay. So now we're coming back right here where we had entered Isaiah. Because at the same time, again, something's happening here. God is going to raise up... Um, during Hezekiah's reign, Nahum is called. He'll speak something of, of encouragement in the second chapter. Nahum has, by the way, only three chapters. The first one lays out the problem. The second one, there's a, some, some blessing protection on Judah. Hey, I'm taking care of this, this enemy of yours. Third chapter, more information of why Nineveh is going to get what it's got coming. Nineveh was not necessarily the capital of Assyria, but it was one of the major cities. And it seems, and it turned out also to be the, uh, the home base of the reigning king of Assyria. That was his, his, his White House. Okay. 
So if you look at 2 uh, Kings uh, 19, verse 35, somebody read 35, 36, 37. Oh, yeah, yeah, do that. And real quick, let me tell you this. There's so much in here, I don't want to miss it. What, what, just pause for one second. Hezekiah has talked to Isaiah. He said, Isaiah, would you talk to God? You're in good with the guy. Can you ask him what's going to happen? We got these threats. Is what going to happen? You know, what happened to Israel? It's going to happen to us. God then is going to speak and says, don't worry about it. I got this. And now we see in these verses what God does. Go ahead. That night, the angel of the Lord went out to the Assyrian camp and killed 185,000 Assyrian soldiers. When the surviving Assyrians woke up the next morning, they found corpses everywhere. And King Sennacherib of Assyria broke camp and returned to his own land. He went home to his capital of Nineveh and stayed there. One day, while he was worshiping in the temple of God in Israel, his sons Adramalek and Shrazar killed him with their swords. <clears throat> They then escaped to the land of Ararat, and another son, Bazar Hadan, became the next king of Assyria. Ah! Shit, huh? Uh-huh. So, good old Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, he uh, has a big army. Don't know how big it is. Maybe it is exactly every man that dropped dead right there. 185,000. 185,000 men. Are, are there surrounding Jerusalem, ready to attack, and, and what happens? It says, then an angel of the Lord, overnight, dispatches them all. Mm -hmm. So in the morning they wake up, and there's 185,000 troop corpses. All right. Is that real? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Don't, don't you remember uh, the 10th plague? When God was bringing the Hebrews out of Egypt, he said, hey, tonight, the angel of death is going to pass through all of Egypt, slaying the firstborn of every house. Better put that blood on your door, get behind the blood, safety behind the blood of a lamb, hint, hint, safety behind the blood of a lamb, hint, hint, and uh, you'll be okay. And we, we see that if God wants to literally put to death a whole bunch of people at once. He's got no problem doing that. He could do it by flood. He could do it by an angel. Sure. So he, he just dismantles an army like that. Wouldn't that be great? I wonder if he would do it again. I wonder if, uh, I wonder if some terrible army one day would be coming to America. I wonder if God would just slay them all. Wow. Or would uh, he allow them to do whatever they need to do to correct us, give us correcting measures? Ooh, scary thoughts, isn't it? Mm -hmm. All right. So, but uh, he sure appreciated Hezekiah because it says Hezekiah and the nation humbled themselves before God. They beseeched them. They begged him, Lord. So, you know, when you got the whole nation doing this, a guy goes, I'm going to keep you. I'm going to keep you around. And he protected him. Fantastic. All right. And then you notice <laughs> he goes, after, after Sennacherib loses 185,000 soldiers, he flees back home to his home in Nineveh, mm -hmm. one of the major leading cities of Assyria. Goes into his temple to pray, to worship, it says his God, probably to go, what happened? Mm -hmm. Why did you leave us alone out there on the battlefield? And then as he's doing that, he gets his just desserts, two of his own boys come up and kill him. Mm -hmm. And then another one of his boys takes the throne, uh, Asar Hadan, and now he's in charge. All right? So, when exactly does name show up? As best that we know, it's during the reign of King Hezekiah. This king right here, who's having some problems with Assyria, and God already does something pretty nice to protect Hezekiah and Judah against the Assyrians. But God's got more in store for the Assyrians. That's what Nahum is going to talk about. But here's the deal. Nahum, if you remember, is the second of two prophets that we see in the scriptures that were called to speak directly to Nineveh. Who was the first? Jonah. <laughs> Thank you, Jennifer. <laughs> Jonah. <laughs> Bam. Yeah. We need a little red dot. <laughs> She's on. Uh, it's Jonah. And 
he gives that message. And at the time, the Assyrians, they believe the message. How wild. And they, they get right, they humble themselves before the God of the Jews. And they get a respite, they get a reprieve, they get some time. Well, years pass, eh, kind of worn off, short-term national revival, let's say. And, um, and now they're as evil and wicked as can be once again. And now God says, all right, that little time of what I saw, of repentance, as we like to say it, it didn't last. Uh, you know, got to gotta now deliver on what I had threatened through Jonah. I'm now guaranteeing through Nahum. Uh, his name, by the way, Nahum, uh, in Hebrew is, is compassionate. Now, the, the message he's giving it ain't compassionate. Uh, it is in the second chapter to Judah, but otherwise he's, he's bringing, uh, uh, you know, some bad news, which is good, but it's a message of doom. And uh, this, uh, I already told you what the three chapters are like. We're going to look at them. I think we're going to jump in them pretty soon here. But Nahum, he, he prophesies the downfall, the judgment of, uh, of God on the city of Nineveh. But it doesn't happen until 612 B.C. That Nineveh falls to the Babylonians, the Medes, and the Scythians. And uh, here's what's interesting. Uh, if you've ever heard of, uh, you've heard of the Enuma Elish? It's an ancient Babylonian creation epic. Very interesting. The Enuma Elish. Uh, there is also the, uh, the uh, Gilgamesh, the Epic of Gilgamesh. You've probably heard that one if you've heard studies some interesting things. Uh, that's where uh, we see the, the goddess Ishtar is a major player in this, this epic. Um, I'm talking about this, I just, we'll just say, in it, does describe a great flood over the earth. It's very interesting. But uh, where we have those, where they came from, they were unearthed by archaeologists in, uh, who found them in Nineveh. And Nineveh, as far as they could tell, um, when it was destroyed, there was a, a massive fire. Remember the old uh, thing of, you know, the Rome burning? Uh, anybody see pictures of the fires of San Francisco. Remember that great fire of San Francisco? So Nineveh, at one point, all we know is it apparently had a whole bunch of fire set to it. Uh, and then about a decade later, uh, there's a final destruction of it. And uh, it's by the Babylonians, the Medes, the Scythians. But um, they had, uh, historically, a massive library. You know, you hear the Library of Alexandria. Uh, they had a massive library, ancient cuneiform tablets, etc., ancient writings, and two of them that they held um, had, uh, they had uh, collected ancient writings from many conquered territories. And they were preserved somehow. They weren't destroyed in the fire, the rampage, and uh, archaeologists found them, and that's why we know of them today. Um, <clears throat> but until that day, until before it gets destroyed, Assyria causes more trouble uh, for Judah. And we're going to talk about that trouble. Um, it continues in the reign of King Manasseh. Now, who is Manasseh? Remember Manasseh? He's the son of King Hezekiah. Hezekiah is the one who consulted Isaiah when King Sennacherib of Assyria was threatening to destroy Judah like it just did Israel. And he calls out to God through Isaiah. God says, I got this. We just read what happened. God destroys all 185,000 troops, etc. Manasseh is the son of Hezekiah. Manasseh actually is the longest reigning king in Judah's history. 55 years is his reign. He's also known as one of the, the most evil kings and the most forgiven king. You know his story. So during that time between Hezekiah, the troops being slayed, the 
king being assassinated by his own boys, and Manasseh's reign, there is a time for Assyria to regroup and rebuild its army. Got it? And they're up to no good again. They're, uh, they're doing what they do best. They're, incredi- they're known for being incredibly violent. I might get into some of the details of what they were known for, uh, if we've got time tonight. But uh, during Manasseh's reign, he reinstitutes this polytheism, you know, to all the pagan gods, all the stuff that actually his father got rid of, he brings it back. Um, he makes a couple of his kids, he says, pass through the fire, I mean, he sacrificed them. It's just terrible. He's, he's full on pagan, and um, God is going to judge him and correct him. And who's he going to use to do it? You get to find that. Okay? Here we go. Flip forward to 2 Chronicles 33. And I will remind you once again that the books of what we call 1 and 2 Chronicles uh, is a summary of the entire Old Testament minus Ezra and Nehemiah. So if you want to read the Old Testament really quick, Read First and Second Chronicles, and so in Second Chronicles there is a, um, a an equivalent of First and Second Kings. It covers the kings. Uh, it goes really fast through a whole lot of them, but camps out on on certain ones, and gives us actually additional information that we don't have in First or Second Kings. So we go to Second Chronicles to get some information about Manasseh that you don't read about in 2 Kings, when 2 Kings addresses Manasseh. So here we go, chapter 33, 2 Chronicles, somebody read 10, 13, 10 to 13. And the Lord spoke to Manasseh and his people, but they would not listen. Therefore the Lord brought upon them the captains of the army of the king of Assyria, who took Manasseh with hooks, bound him with bronze fetters, and carried him off to Babylon. Now when he was in affliction, he implored the Lord his God, and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers, and prayed to him, and he received his entreaty, heard his supplication, and brought him back to Jerusalem into his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord was God. All right, now, here's what's amazing. Manasseh, uh, he leads the nation in uh, child sacrifice, a whole bunch of vile practices, sexual unrestraint, that whole 10 yards, um, Baal worship and more. And uh, he is captured, taken into captivity by the Assyrians, and he humbles himself. And we don't get a whole lot of information, but I I don't know what it was like, but whatever it was, it was sincere. God knows the heart, doesn't he? Something happened with Manasseh where he, let's say, he got Old Testament way born again. He got right with God. He repented. Whatever that was like in the Old Testament. God saw his heart, heard his prayers. I have no clue. I can imagine what God had to have seen and required from Manasseh to really demonstrate, boy, did I blow it. I cannot believe what I allowed myself to do. I cannot believe I am so different from my dad. I can't believe I led my nation. And and often he realizes now who he really is. You ever have a moment like that? Remember those moments? You ever have more than once? Where you finally, you come to grips with who you really are. Those are the most painful moments. But it's when you have that deep introspection and you realize how sinful you are. Well, he's having that moment there. And it's tremendous. God sees it. God then, we don't get details. But he's released and restored. He's restored? He gets to be king again. You're kidding me. Why? This is what always amazes me about his story. You, you just, you're just shocked that God didn't just put him to death and let him be put to death in prison. I mean, I, I would have done that kill the guy. But God's a little different. He goes, you know what? I might get more out of this if I uh, can forgive him and demonstrate what kind of a forgiving, long-suffering God I am, and I could actually take this guy and restore him because he's had a humbling experience. Mm -hmm. 
And now he's going to go back and say, everybody, I was wrong. Boy, we're all wrong. We're not going to do that stuff anymore. We're all turning and following God. And that's a wise thing. That's a brilliant move on God's uh, part. Because let's say the next, who's the next king that maybe would have replaced Manasseh? Who says that king wouldn't go the same route? I, uh, you know the story. I know it's a real story. Can't give you all the details. I just know it. You've heard it. I'm sure I've shared it before. There's an IBM executive made a, I want to say a $3 million mistake on an afternoon. Remember this? He, he goes up to the, the president's office, has his resignation uh, all signed, puts it on his desk and turns to leave. And the president says, where are you going? He says, sir, I'm sure you're ex ex expecting this. And he said, I just invest, we, we just invested $30 million in your education. I get back to work. <laughs> That's a president that understands the value of failure and what you learn not to repeat. But light should be so. And I was about to go there. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. But I knew. You got it. <laughs> that was fun. She did. And she's not repentant at all. <laughs> Which president was that? He gave his testimony several years back at yeah. National Day of Prayer. Wow. And he plagiarized when he was working for the George W. Bush as the president of the United States. And he came and gave his testimony about how he went and confessed in the, in the Oval Office. And as he went to leave, the president said, I know a lot about forgiveness. Wow. You're forgiven. Wow. Kept him on. Yeah. 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 <laughs> That's it's interesting. That you think about it, you have a better chance of that guy not <laughs> being guilty of plagiarism again oh, compared to a new hire that might do. Okay. Um, Back to 2 Kings. Uh, if you look at chapter 21, this is where in 2 Kings, Manasseh's story is covered. And it's a verse 12. It says, you know, uh, thus said the Lord of God of Israel, I'm bringing upon Jerusalem and Judah such evil that the ears of everyone that hears it will tingle. You know, it's because of all the evil that Manasseh and all them have brought upon it, etc. But then, then, then 2 Chronicles gives us this other story of this redemption, wonderful thing. And then um, uh, Manasseh dies, uh, verse 18. Uh, his son Ammon uh, uh, succeeds him. Uh, that's verse 19. Uh, you look at that to the end, not a lot of information about him. Chapter 22, verse 1, the son of Ammon. This is the grandson now of Manasseh, the great-grandson of Hezekiah. And this is now the king, and his name is Josiah. Josiah. Wow, he goes down to history. He's, he's a good one. Okay, he's a good one. And how old is this guy? Eight he's eight years old. <laughs> they don't make him like they used to. I would have taken this guy over. Never mind. So, <laughs> right? You already know it. We were all. Thinking I'd rather that. take this eight-year-old king over the. Yeah, you got it. Okay. So, um, it, it's a beautiful thing, and it's during Josiah's reign that we meet the prophet Jeremiah. And what's interesting about when Jeremiah enters the scene. Oh, so does Zephaniah and Habakkuk, and it's going to be beautiful. And then, pretty soon, we're not many chapters away, Judah is then conquered, taken captive by the Babylonians. And then you've got, oh, Lamentations, Jeremiah's second book. Oh, how terrible grieving is the city, you know, as he talks about what Jerusalem's now like after it's been conquered. And then Daniel shows up. That's where Daniel, the, the prophet, shows up because he's the prophet speaking in the land of captivity, etc. There's a couple other prophets that or do the same. We'll see that when we get there. But here we go. We get to open to, to Nahum. Now that we got the, uh, the back story. Chapter 1. Verse 1 of Nahum. Right after Micah. Right before Habakkuk. 
It's not how you say it, I just said that. <laughs> Habach. God bless you. It's half cook, half cook, half cook, half cook, half cook. Nahum. Here we go. Verse one. Somebody just read the first verse. And then we're going to take a big chunk. A report on the problem of Nineveh, the way God gave Nahum of Elkosh to see it. There it is. Okay. That's all it is. It's a big, huge verse. Okay. <laughs> Gotta read that because uh, we're not, that's all the information we got about him. <laughs> now, there it is. That's everything we know about him. That's it. That's all I got. That's it. That's it. Because you know what? It's not about him. It's about God. We don't, we don't, we don't need notoriety. Remember, remember that I always love this. The Lone Ranger. I used, I love the Lone Ranger. I grew up on the Lone Ranger. And at the end of every episode, after he did something wonderful, he saved the town, he rides off, and the townspeople would say, Who was that last man? Kimosabi. <laughs> Who was that last man? And may the Lord say that about us. Uh-huh. Right? Okay, he says that about Nahum pretty much. It's like, well, who was the guy? We don't know anything about the guy. We just know he, he, in case it's not about him, it's about it's about God. Okay, so uh, you didn't say man. Uh, you didn't, you didn't, you I didn't, didn't say no. You didn't bring not that. Yeah, not that kind of man. Uh-huh. Not the. Uh-huh. Okay. The, Thank you. <laughs> yeah, not that one. That's funny. That's funny. <laughs> That's funny. Okay, so. Uh, <clears throat> It says <laughs> he's from El Kosh. What's funny is that there's not a lot known about that place either. Uh, and scholars have, have, have tried, have literally looked at it. They thought it could be anywhere from Iraq, where, where Nineveh it was, modern day Iraq. It could have been Capernaum. It could have been in the area of Galilee. I mean, because there's some other ancient villages that have a name similar to that, and they just don't know which it is. Let's put that in there again. It's not about him or where he came from. He's, he gets that much page time. The rest is what God has to say. And now we look at uh, verses 2 to 11. Somebody give me that whole chunk. The jealous and avenging God is the Lord. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries, and he reserves wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and the Lord will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. In whirlwind and storm is his way, and clouds are the dust beneath his feet. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry. He dries up all the rivers. Bashan and Carmel wither. The blossoms of Lebanon wither. Mountains quake because of him, and the hills dissolve. Indeed, the earth is upheaved by his presence, the world and all the inhabitants in it. Who can stand before his indignation? Who can endure the burning of his anger? His wrath is poured out like fire, and the rocks are broken up by him. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knows those who take refuge in him. But with an overflowing flood, he will make a complete end of his sight, and will pursue his enemies into darkness. Whatever he devises against the Lord, he will make a complete end of it. Distress will not rise up twice. Like tangled thorns and like those who are drunken with their drink, they are consumed as stubble completely withered. From you has gone forth one who plotted evil against the Lord, a wicked counsel. Mm. Okay. First thing in verse 2, there's a number of things that God has described as. The first thing is... He's jealous. You know, that, that shows up a good amount of times in the scriptures, doesn't it? I want to remind you of the difference between jealousy and envy. It doesn't say that he's envious. Envy is when you want something that belongs to somebody else. Jealousy is when you when you want what's already yours. Uh-huh. If, if, if somebody's taking somebody's heart away from you that you love, you get jealous because you want what you already have. That's why God is not, he said, not envy. What doesn't he own? He's not envious of anything. He can be jealous. So it says he's a jealous God. That's what usually says it arouses him to, to act. 
He goes, somebody's taking what belongs to me, my peeps, okay? The heart of my people, the spiritual life of my people, the priority of my people, etc. So he's a jealous God, and then you see what it says. You know, he... <laughs> he's avenging wrathful. Woohoo! Takes vengeance on his adversary. Uh -huh. um, but he's slow to anger. He's slow to anger. But man, he's great power. And the Lord will by no means clear the guilty. Which is why we got to have a sacrifice. We need to have Jesus to cover it. Because otherwise, he has to clear it somehow. So he clears us or we're not cleared at all. Okay. Uh, and of course, his way... He's in the whirlwind and storm and da 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 go. Who can stand before his indignation? In this rhetorical question, verse 6, second rhetorical question, who can endure the heat of his anger? Uh, nobody. Nobody. You know, his wrath is poured out like fire. Uh-huh. On and on. But he's a stronghold. In a day of trouble. For those who seek refuge in him. Okay, that's nice. Um, but man, he's going to make a fool out of his enemies. And what's interesting, I, I look at that, do, do you notice this? Verse 3, watch this. In the midst of all this, man, God, you, he's like, I, I'd say this about all of our military, but, you know, it's the Marines, I think, who, that use the slogan, uh, the Marines, your, your best friend and your worst enemy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Okay. Um, that is God. Best friend, worst enemy. And in the midst of all this, through Nahum, being spoken to the city of Nineveh, God throws in a couple of little things. I think they're hands to me. It's um, a little, a little something. He throws them a little bone, and we'll see if, if they catch him. He, of, he's avenging, wrathful, takes vengeance, rages against his enemies, but he's slow to anger. Okay, uh, he's gonna come get you. He can't stand for him. Nobody's able to. But he's a stronghold. For those that take refuge in him, Amen. what's God doing? Yeah. This is what he's always been doing. He goes, I can be your worst enemy. I can be your best friend. You choose. You choose. Yeah. I, that's how I see it. I see it and I go, I, I think I get this. And I think you're smart enough to get it too. You'd be reading this and to you, hopefully, those two lines pop out of the rest. You go, ah, I want to know that part of God. I want to know that characteristic. I want that guy to slow to anger, uh, you know, be my stronghold because I'm going to take refuge in him. I ain't going down with the boat here at the ship. All right. So, uh, beautiful stuff. And uh, I, love, I love that line. He will make an end. No adversary will rise up twice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's saying Nineveh, um, you know, they, they get to come get Jerusalem a second time. They did during Hezekiah's day. You know, they came against him during Manasseh's day, but that's the last straw. Okay. Um, and let's continue. Let's go uh, 12 to the end. Thus says the Lord, though they are at full strength and likewise many, even so they will be cut off and pass away. Though I have afflicted you, I will not, I will afflict you no longer. So now I will break this yoke bar from upon you, and I will tear off your shackles. Now, who do you, now who's God talking to you there? There's a little aside to Judah, right? Hey, listen, even though there's a whole bunch of them, don't worry about it. I'm going to thin the herd. Um, I'm going to, you know, even though you got shackles on you, so to speak, I'm going to break them. Okay, and then he goes back to, uh, he keeps going, uh, keep reading 14 to the end. The Lord has issued a command concerning you. Your name will no longer be perpetrated. I will cut off idol and image from the house of your gods. I will prepare your grave, for you are contemptible. Behold, on the mountains, the feet of him who brings good news. Who announces peace? Celebrate your feasts, O Judah. Pay your vows, for never again will the wicked one pass through you. He is cut off completely. Now, who is he speaking to? Judah. 
Interesting. Uh, do you like verse 15? Now, I mean, you know, he's going, we're, we're going to get rid of the, the, the evil from your nation as well. These, you know, images and all. Um, Got to put some of you in the grave, you know. Uh, Look on the mountains, the feet of one who brings good news, good tidings, who proclaim peace. Isn't that interesting? Remember? <coughs> Isaiah says the same kind of thing. Paul quotes it in Romans 10 that we looked at last Sunday. Almost the same kind of statement. But not about the gospel, but it's about what? What's the good news here? What's the good tidings? Tidings of peace. As if, you know, it hasn't happened yet. But again, God's painting a picture of when he takes care of Assyria, news is going to spread and people are going to go through Judah and go, ha ha, they're dead, you know? Uh, God smote them and we're safe. And they're not going to get us anymore. They're not going to come at us. That's great. Okay, so it's that's what he's painting the picture. All right, there's chapter one. <gasps> chapter two. Look how much <laughs> do we're doing. I can't believe this. Chapter two. Now, um, this one. Uh, <clears throat> somebody take it, the whole thing. One to 13. Yeah, can you believe this? The one who scatters has come up against you. Man the fortress. Watch the road. Strengthen your back, summon all your strength. The Lord will restore the splendor of Jacob like the splendor of Israel. Even though devastators have devastated them and destroyed their vine branches. The shield of his mighty men are colored red. The warriors are dressed in scarlet. The chariots are enveloped in flashing steel. When he's prepared to march and the cypress spears are brandished. The chariots race madly in the streets. They rush wildly in the squares. Their appearance is like torches. They dash to and fro like lightning flashes. He remembers his nobles. They stumble in their march. They hurry to her wall. Let me pause you right there. What was just described, historically, the shields of the Medes and the Babylonians were red. Or it says right here, scarlet, red. Uh, and they said it's either from blood, from all their conquests, uh, or from a red dyed leather over their shields. Um... They wore a scarlet attire. Uh, there was something about, however, the, the, the scarlet, the look of it, made them look ominous, kind of scary. Um, so uh, there's an ancient writer, um, Zetophon, ancient Greek writer. He, write, he wrote about the Persians in Cyrus's army being dressed in scarlet. And uh, the metal on the chariots, uh, they purposefully made them like blinding. The sun would hit them and it would be, whew, can't look even at the, the, the bright, um, you know, pounded metal, the sheet metal. You tell us about this. On, uh, on these chariots, uh, glisten like in the sun. And uh, that's what's being described right here. So keep going. The gates of the rivers are opened and the palace is dissolved. It is fixed. She is stripped, she is carried away, and her handmaids are moaning like the sound of doves beating on their breasts. Though Nineveh was a pool of water throughout her days, now they are fleeing. Stop, stop, but no one turns back. Plunder the silver, plunder the gold, for there is no limit to the treasure. Wealth from every kind of desirable object. She is empty, yes, she is desolate and waste. Hearts are melting and knees knocking. Also anguish is in the whole body, and all their faces are grown pale. <laughs> where is the den of the lions, and the feeding place of the young lions, where the lion, lioness, and lion's cub prowled with nothing to disturb him? The lion tore enough for his cubs, killed enough for his lionesses, and filled his lairs with prey, and his dens with torn flesh. Behold, I am against you, declares the Lord of hosts. I will burn up her chariots and smoke. A sword will devour your young lions. I will cut off your prey from the land, and no longer will the voice of your messengers be heard. Okay. <coughs> what do you see? <clears throat> What's described? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the city is flooded. Verse 8. Nine. Um, symbolic? Literal. Nineveh is like a pool whose waters run away. Uh, 
Uh, interesting, uh, some ancient, or some, some, some ancient writings, and Josephus, Flavius Josephus writes about Nineveh being known for having aquifers, you know, aqueducts, things, things that just, just had a great water, like Rome built, um, if you're familiar with that. And they, uh, but they'd be easily uh, overflowing if there was a large rain. And somebody, uh, the historian writes that about this time, a massive, massive storm came. And that what was, this was actually what was prophesied here. That God was saying these, this flood thing would come, you all run away and you can't come back. Uh, I want you to remember, when was the storm here, the big flood here in Rapid? 72. 72. Okay, I want you to think about that for a moment. It's possible. Mm -hmm. And you don't go back to your house. Right. And the idea is that that actually took place. That part of the judgment of God was actually a big storm and it uh, drove people out of Nineveh, out of the city. Interesting. Okay, chapter 2. And uh, hey, that verse 11, you know, 12, uh, <clears throat> what became of the lion's den? Uh, the idea is that Nineveh, or the Assyrians, they call themselves like lions. They're warriors. We are like lions. And so God is there going, hey, hey what happened? You know, tell this lion thing. You know, where are you now? Uh, you, you're not as tough as you thought you were. All right, we're actually going to do this. Chapter 3, the final chapter, somebody. Uh, give me first seven verses. Woe to the bloody city. It is all full of lies and robbery. Its victim never departs. The noise of the whip and the noise of the rattling wheels, of galloping horses, of clattering chariots, horsemen charged with bright sword and glittering spear. There is a multitude of slain. A great number of bodies, countless corpses. In fact, let me pause you right there. Nineveh was truly a city of blood. Uh, historically, it was one of the most violent cultures uh, in the day. Uh, things that they were known for, they just had an uncontrolled lust for blood and murder. Um, uh, it had this title, City of Blood, because of the practices that they had of cutting off uh, their adversaries' hands, feet, ears, noses, gouging out eyes, lopping off heads, binding them uh, to the wall, literally skinning people alive. Um, and an, uh, they would take their adversaries, their enemies, and they would skin them alive and then hang their, their skins all around the city walls. I mean, this, this, this historically accurately what N the Assyrians were like. And it was like in Nineveh. So God is saying, what you're hearing right there, uh, all the violence, all the bloodshed, I'm putting an end to it, and I'm, I'm going to return upon your heads, your behavior. Okay? So, a little, little rough there, but okay. Um, let's keep going. They stumble over the corpses and the multitudes of harlotries around the seductive harlot. The mistresses of the sorceries, who tells the nations through her harlotries and families through her sorceries. <coughs> Behold, I'm against you, says the Lord of hosts. I will lift your skirts over your face. I will show the nations your nakedness and the kingdom your shame. I will cast abominable filth upon you, make you vile, and make you a spectacle. It shall come to pass that all who look upon you will flee from you and say, Nineveh is a laid waste. Who will bemoan her? Where shall I seek comforters for you? All right. More is described about it. Um, witchcraft, sorceries, heart the tree, prostitution. Uh, they, they do go hand in hand. Um, in the ancient world, and I would say in the modern world, you don't really, you, most people would not connect the two, but the... Uh, as, as there is an increase of a demonic activity, there is always an increase of, human, of, of sexuality, perversity, and then even an, open, an openness to the occult and to, uh, to, to the belief of, 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 uh, of what is forbidden in the scriptures. You know, the psychics, the 
It's all, all the stuff that our country is doing, cult, culture is doing, okay? SatanCon in um, mm. Baltimore sold out. SatanCon sold out. Sold out. Y'all hear about that? Yeah, Baltimore. And when is it? That's taking place pretty soon, isn't it? <clears throat> SatanCon. Yeah, a whole bunch of people going to this convention. Sold out. I wonder how many people. Think about that. Can you believe that's happening? Yeah. If faith, if faith can move a mountain, maybe we can move a volcano. Yeah, right. That's right. <laughs> right? All right. Um, 8 to 13. Are you better than thieves that sat by the Nile with water around her, her rampart of sea, water her wall? Ethiopia was her strength, Egypt too, and that without limit. What in the Libyans were her helpers? I'll stop you right there. So the Assyrians, um, conquered Thebes. It's, it's in, in Egypt. And, um, so that helps us also know where Nahum is placed. It's after that took place. Um, so just FYI. Okay. Keep going. Yes. She became an exile. She went into captivity. Even her infants were dashed in pieces at the head of every street. Lots were cast for her nobles. All her dignitaries were bound in fetters. You also will be drunken. You will go into hiding. You will seek a refuge from the enemy. All your fortresses are like fig trees with first ripe figs. They have shaken and fall into the mouth of the eater. Look at your troops. They are women in your midst. The gates of your land are wide open to your foes. Fire has devoured the bars of your gates. Okay, so what you did to them, it's going to do to you, right? It's going to happen to you. Interesting, it says, your soldiers are going to be like women in your midst. No insult to the women, but generally speaking, you want an army of men can, compared to an army of all women. But if your army was all women, I just wonder how safe would you feel? It depends on the women. But generally speaking, generally speaking, but um, so the idea is that the, the, your, your men are going to become um, not the fighting force that you need. You can't, you can't do anything about it. Okay. Uh, let's go 14 to the end. Store up water for the siege, shore up your defenses, get down to basics, work the clay and make bricks. Sorry, too late, enemy fire will burn you up. Swords will cut you to pieces, you'll be chewed up as if by locusts. Yes, as if by locusts, a fitting fate, you yourselves are a locust play. You've multiplied shops and shopkeepers, more buyers and sellers than stars in the sky. A plague of locusts cleaning out the neighborhood and then flying off. Your bureaucrats are locusts. Your brokers and bankers are locusts. Mm. Early on, they are all at your service, full of smiles and promises. But later, when you return with complaints or questions, you'll find they've flown off or are nowhere to be found. King of Syria, your shepherd leaders in charge of caring for your people are busy doing everything else but. They're not doing their job, and your people are scattered and lost. There's no one to look after them. You're past the point of no return. Your wound is fatal. When the story of your fate gets out, the whole world will applaud and cry encore. <laughs> your cruel evil has seeped into every nook and cranny of the world. Everyone has felt it and suffered. Mm. You know the message when you read. Isn't it good? How about a message I might put for this? In, in, in the, it, it, good, good, good. I tell you, tell everyone, right? Tell everyone. Pick whatever you want, English translation, but get the message. Yeah, it's powerful. All right, that's it. Amazing. And uh, here we go. This army of lions. Yeah. You're gonna become defenseless. Um, everything you've done, to others, man, do to you. You were like locusts. You'd come in. You'd devour. You know, you would strip a, a country. Uh, you'd take everything from them. You'd plunder their wealth, etc. You'd leave nothing remaining. Uh, that's exactly what's gonna happen to you. So, uh, again. This could be a while till it comes to pass, but it does. About 622 BC. Uh, but this is spoken during Hezekiah's reign. 
which is why we went through it tonight. And I think that's all we got to go through. I think that's it. Wow. 805? How'd that happen? Okay, time for cake. Time for cake. Yes. I uh, had to summarize that book, those three chapters. That's just God being God. That's God being God. Yep. He just does what he That's what he is. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Always fair warning. Oh, always fair warning. Yes, ma'am. I think it's interesting because in my study of Habakkuk, we're not in the Army. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so they got time. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but, uh, no, which is good. Sir, Lieutenant Colonel, by the way. Right. Remember that? Air Force. Air Force. Yeah. Yes, um, but uh, it's just interesting in my own study of that, you know, even growing up as a Baptist preacher's daughter, et cetera, et cetera, I did not know very much about the Syria because it's just not something you study much. And, you know, all of these people came from Hamsham and Japheth. There was the truth in their line, and they rejected it, and this is the utter rejection oh. of the truth of God. These people were not just instantly, amazingly wicked. This was a whole process, and it was hundreds of years, 14, 15, 14 or 2,000 years worth of debauchery. Just, but they started out monotheistic, and then added gods, and then added the stuff. And I tell you what, what an ugly picture of where things go apart from the truth. And it's just... God wasn't just destroying random people. All well, these people knew him originally and then walked away. In the worst of the way. Yeah. Great reminder. The flood was the do over of creation. Yep. So we all came from one of those three Shem, Ham, or Japheth. And then, uh, yeah, there you got that. Now, now, what are we now? Uh, okay. Anything else? So, Jennifer says that their old church, her old church, former church, every time they finished a book, they'd have cake. We'd have, we could have had cake two nights in a row, two weeks in a row. Kind of inspires that expedition, right, right? I, that could be a really cool tradition, though. Think about it. Hmm? Yeah, well, we don't know what happened now, but I mean, that's, I think it's a great idea. Uh, yeah, Joe. Does that mean that Jennifer wears the cake with the red idea? Yes. It's your idea, you bring it. Loretta, great cake maker. Baker. All right. Thank you all. Uh, hope you better, have a better understanding of Nahum. And uh, next week, we'll go a little bit more through Second Kings. <laughs> And uh, we don't go very far, but we're, we're going to look at the life of, and the, the reign of Josiah, which is very exciting. And that may be all we get. But then, like I said, in the midst of that, before we can even go further, we got to go through Jeremiah. <sighs> but I don't know if we want to, I don't know, got to decide, do, wanna go as, do we want to go the same pace we did in Isaiah? Ain't no hurry. It's long. <laughs> I like cake. It's a good answer. That's all I have to say. I like cake. Got it. Hey, David, Got it. Code so language. Make, make a motion that we have cake after every chapter. Yeah, after every chapter. You know, tonight. Yes. Kind of ironic, but uh, I find that uh, you really have to pay attention to keep up with the speed at which you're going, and it doesn't let you kind of just fall back and not think. So you like the speed? I don't know if I like it. It's stressful. <laughs> it's stressful? It's stressful. It is, uh, well, it's just stressful keeping up. Okay. But it's, uh, it really forces you to bear down and try to get it all quick enough. Okay. For okay. me, anyway. Okay. Who knows nothing. Okay. It was good. This, this, this was definitely e easier to go through quickly. But uh, yeah, so. Depends what's in there. Well, we already had most of the required history, too. You know, so that. Yes. It matter of Isn't that true? Yeah. Yes. Okay. But y'all gave a good hand, get a better grip on the Old Testament? Mm -hmm. yeah. And just the overall picture? Okay. There's so much.
There's so much there, but good job for you. All right. We'll go. Bill, would you praise that? Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your word mm. that's so complete, so reliable, Lord, mm. that all we have to do is dig in, open it up, and exercise ourselves to see what's there. Mm. For us, you gave it for us. Mm. And Lord, we, we trust you in, in all ways to, to meet all of our needs. All we need to do is lean on you, follow you, obey your word, and there you are to take care of us, Lord. We, we thank you for this church, for this body. We thank you for the opportunity to come here and see what you would have for us. And I ask now, Lord, that uh, you give all of us safety on our way home. And we'll see each other again on Sunday. Mm -hmm. In the name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thanks, everybody.